Well, this morning, guys, the, uh, the title of the message is going to be, When Seasons Change. Notice I didn't put, if seasons change. There's a very specific reason for that, and that is because no matter where you are in life, no matter what you're doing, your season is going to change. I don't know if you've noticed that that's kind of a trend that happens with all of us throughout our lives, but, you know, you're born, you learn to crawl and walk and eat and all that stuff, and you get to go to school, and then you get to graduate school, and then you get to get a job and all these things, and no matter what, life is constantly progressing. And, you know, there's a lot of talk going on about the season that we're in right now and the season that our country's in and the state of our country and the state of the world and the, the season that we're dealing with. And, and that's specifically because the Word talks a lot about different seasons. The Word mentions it over and over and over. And no matter what your take is on where we are in this world and in this time, it's pretty obvious to see that things are greatly changing. You know, over the past easily 100 years, maybe 200 years, we've had more advances than in every year leading up to that. Every day, our technology is advancing so rapidly, it's doubling and doubling and doubling all over itself. You know, computers right now can do so much more. Uh, actually, a friend of mine, we have some, uh, some good friends that are A-10 pilots, or they were A-10 pilots, and they have this computer system that um, allows you to train against the computer for dog fights, aerial dog fights. Anybody ever seen Top Gun? Yeah, there's a new one coming out. I don't know how you guys feel about watching movies like that, but I personally can't wait. I think it's going to be awesome. Um, but now this computer system that they, that they try to battle against, it now has become so technologically advanced that these fighter pilots can't even beat the system now. And that's just recent. That's just recent. So. Uh, this technology and the seasons that we're coming into, you know, one of the main things that the Word says that we have to be able to do before the end time is to be able to reach all the world, all the people groups in the world. That used to seem absolutely absurd, absolutely impossible. But now it's not impossible. Now it's absolutely possible. It's so easy for us to be able to, right now, we're streaming. People don't have to just be sitting in this room to be able to hear this teaching. People are going to be watching this teaching online. They're going to be able to watch it later. You know, it can stream into somebody's, into somebody's room. My mom lives in another country right now. She could be watching it live right now. It's amazing that we have now the technology to be able to reach everybody. There's nowhere that we can't go. There's nothing that we can't do. So, times are definitely changing. We're going to be in John chapter 2, and we're going to be covering verses 1 through 11. If you want to turn there or click there, I know some of you use your phones and iPads or whatever. So, if you want to turn there, you can. I will be referencing a couple different scriptures today, but for the most part, we are going to be in John chapter 2. And for those of you that do join our Zoom Bible study on Wednesday mornings, some of this may be a little bit repetitive for you, um, but I do hope that I can shine some new light on some things as well and bring it all back to being applicable for us in our everyday lives. So John chapter 2, verse 1 says, The next day there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee, and Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. That's good news. Jesus likes to party. The wine supply ran out during the festivities. So Jesus, uh, Jesus' mother told him, they have no more wine. Jesus' response here, um, and I would, just, I would ask that you uh, give Jesus some, some slack. It probably, he probably didn't say it like you might read it in your Bible. Fortunately, I pulled a translation where he at least says, dear woman. Um, most of them just say woman. 
And if I said that to my mother, oh, these teeth might not still be here. He said, dear woman, that's not our problem, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. But his mother didn't even, didn't even respond back to him and what he said. She says, but his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Standing nearby, there were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold approximately 20 to 30 gallons of water. Six jars, 20 to 30 gallons apiece. Keep that in mind. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of the ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. When the master of the ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine not knowing where it had come from, though, of course, the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. He says, a host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then, when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine, but you have kept the best until now. This miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now, I will tell you, Whenever I was going over this, as I've gone over it several times, there's just so much packed in here. There is so much in these few 11 verses to get into, but I'm only going to go over just a little bit of it. Um, first and foremost, this point in time, this is where Jesus' season changed at his first miracle. His season truly changed at this very first miracle. Now, keep in mind, Jesus had already been baptized. The Father already spoke over him, and you can find that in Matthew 3, 11 through 17, where he's, he's being baptized. In fact, I think I'll probably just go ahead and read it real quick. Because baptism is such an important part of our seasons. It's such an important part of what we do in our lives if we want to be filled with the Spirit, if we want to be filled with the power of God to be able to do the things that He's called us to do when He's called us to do them, we have to be obedient to do what He's told us to do. And one of the first things that He tells us to do is actually get baptized so that we can operate in His power. So this says, this is a, um, John the Baptist speaking right here. He says, I baptize with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He's talking about Jesus here. He says, he is, his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. That's something that you might want to go back and, and just study a little bit on your, on your own. I'm not going to get into that too much today. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? I can't even imagine what John was thinking here. But Jesus answered him. This is very, very important. This is super important, guys. Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Can you imagine if Jesus himself said to you he wanted you to do something with him and he said that this is necessary for us, for us to be able to fulfill all righteousness? That's outstanding. It gets me fired up. Then he consented. John, yeah. Then he finally consents to Jesus. Okay, I guess I'll do it. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and then another version says, and descending like a dove and lightning. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's pretty awesome. And uh, coming to rest on him, and behold, a voice from heaven said, they're all hearing this. They're all hearing this. And a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. So what just happened here? Jesus came to John. He was obedient to be baptized to fulfill the word of the Lord so that all righteousness 
could happen. He was baptized, and then he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he received confirmation from his heavenly Father that what he was doing was pleasing to him. What he was doing was pleasing to God the Father. Did you know that every single day, Jesus, the word says that he stole away and he spent time with the Father. He spent time with the Father. The word says that he only did what he saw the Father do and he would only say what he saw, heard the Father saying. That's in um, John five nineteen. If you want to uh, look at that, you can. You don't have to turn to it right now. But at this point, whenever they're at, at Cana, he had already been baptized. He had already received the power of the Holy Spirit. He already got the confirmation from his father that he was doing what he was supposed to be doing, when and where he was supposed to be doing it. That's that, that's that peace that can come over you. The Word says that God gives you a peace that surpasses all understanding. You can't even understand the peace that, he's, that he gives you. But whenever you are lined up in his will, doing what he says, when he says, how he says, you're going to be in peace. No matter what your circumstances are, no matter what season you're in, no matter what is surrounding you, you will have that peace because you know that the Lord is with you. So he's in Galilee, and, or he's in Cana of Galilee, this little city. He's already been baptized, and he's already been tempted if you want, you can read Matthew 4, 1 through 11. I'm not going to read that today. But that's where Jesus is out in the wilderness getting tempted. He fasts for 40 days. The Word says, he fasted for 40 days and then he was hungry. I'm like, what? <laughs> he got hungry after that 40 days? I mean, give me 40 minutes. You know what I mean? I could, I could use a snack. Yeah. So... He fasts for 40 days, and then, whenever he's weak, whenever he's tired, whenever he's depleted of his nutrients, that's whenever the enemy comes in to start lying to him, so to start tempting him to do the things that he knows that he's not supposed to do. And every time, the enemy brings that word against him, and he tries to twist the truth, doesn't he? He tries to tell him, well, the word says this. Aren't you supposed to do this? You should do this. You should bow down to me. If you do this, I'll give you everything you see. But he knew who he was. He knew who he was even in a state of having fasted for 40 days. In a wilderness. In a dry and desolate place. I mean, I'm sitting up here right now and my mouth's already a little dry. You know, I could use some water. I've got some, don't worry. But think about what Jesus was going through. Whenever the Word says that He understands what you're going through, that there's not a single way that we can be tempted, that Jesus Christ Himself was not tempted, trust me, He was tempted that way. The Word says it, and that's an absolute truth. He was tempted that way. I would venture to say that there's probably some temptations that He had to go through in that wilderness that aren't even listed in here. But not, let's not even take the wilderness... Let's take whenever he's in a city and he's walking down the street. Is he not going to be tempted then? He was flesh. He was a human being. He was God and flesh in our human flesh. So I guarantee you there were lots of temptations that he had to go through. The Word says, I believe it was John specifically, that said all of the things that Jesus did couldn't be contained in all the books in all the world. The things that he did. So... This was his very first miracle. He had been tempted, he had been baptized, and he had already been teaching in the synagogues. You can find that in Matthew 4, 17 if you want. So he's going about, and he's still doing, he's doing things already. He's already starting to teach. He's already starting to influence people. We know by this that he and his disciples were invited to go party. I would love to party with Jesus and his disciples. I can't wait because one day I am going to because the word says whenever I go to heaven that they are all going to party. I can't wait. That's going to be a blast. We're all going to party. Hopefully you guys will see me there. So he teaches in the synagogue. So we know that he's already affecting his area of influence, but he truly did not know that his time had come yet. He truly didn't know that his time had come yet. You know, like I said, in John 5, 19, it says that, I can only, that God can only do what he sees the Father doing. But he spent time with him every day. 
And we know that he went where God told him to go. He talked to the people God told him to talk to. He did the things that God told him to do. And he gets to this party, they run out of wine. His mom tells him they ran out of wine. And he's like, hey, my time has not yet come. This just, it's just amazing to me. We're dealing with God here. We're dealing with the Son of God here. He tells his mother, my time has not yet come. He's already been doing stuff. He's already been affecting his area of influence. He's already been doing everything that God tells him to do. But God didn't tell him to make more wine, he's saying. But she looks at him, and she says, they're out of wine. And he's like, okay. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. So... Jesus, and this is, you'll have to forgive me. Like, when I'm up here, you get a little glimpse into my brain and how it works and, and my thought process. I know Jesus has a great sense of humor um, because we're created in his image and in his likeness. Um, so I, I assume that my sense of humor, whether it's not like your sense of humor or not, it was given to me by him. So Jesus couldn't lie. That's another thing. He died sinless. The word says, for our, in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, for our sake, he made him, God made him, made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin. He knew no sin. He had never sinned his whole life until he was in that garden. He still didn't sin, but he took on our sin, our shame, our hurts, our pain, our regrets, he took on all of those things, even though he had never sinned. He made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We got to trade places. He took my nastiness and I took his righteousness. That's amazing. It's amazing. He was still obedient to his earthly mother and his heavenly father. Does the word not say to honor your father and your mother? It absolutely does. His mom clearly wanted him to help out. You know, they got invited to this wedding. They were probably friends of the people that invited them there. They wanted them there. So she didn't want them to be ashamed or embarrassed or whatever. If you've, uh, if you've ever seen the, uh, the new um, TV series that's out, The Chosen. They, they depict this in such an interesting way. It's, it's, it's really a way that I kind of figure that it probably was like because he's so compassionate, he's so loving, he's so caring. And at this point, he remained obedient to his mother. She tells him, they're out of wine. He says, Mom, my time hasn't come yet. She looks away from him and tells the servants, do whatever he tells you to do. Essentially, she's saying, yes, it has. <laughs> yeah, your time has come. It's right now. And you know, he spent time with the father that morning. The word says that he would get up early in the morning and spend time with the father. God didn't tell him that day that he was going to be creating wine for a party. Not only did he create wine, he created six stone water jars with 20 or 30 gallons a piece. I don't know how many people were at this party. I don't know how much they drank beforehand, but they had a lot to drink now. So the party kept going. Now, so he was obedient to his earthly mother and his heavenly father. Obviously, his heavenly father wants him to honor her. Jesus even though he told her, my time has not yet come, just like, it's, isn't it just like him? That even though he told her, my time has not yet come, he was still obedient and he still wanted to do the will of the Father. If you think about it, whenever he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, he's praying and he's, he's in such turmoil because he knows what's about to happen. He knows he's about to take on the weight of the world. He knows that he's the sinless, spotless lamb. He knows that he's about to fulfill the purpose that God had put on his life and that that was going to be excruciating. 
Worse than anything anyone could ever imagine, he knew that, yet his words are, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, Lord, but yours be done. Nevertheless, if you can't, if there's absolutely no other way, and there was no other way, there were thousands of years of proof that there was no other way. There weren't enough animals in the world for them to take away the sin of everyone. No possible way. So he says, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So, what I'd like is I would like everybody to, myself included, believe me, I'm speaking to myself today, totally speaking to myself today, is... Look at the season of life that you're in right now and put it into perspective. If you have a bad thought process of what's going on, if you have a bad perspective, if you you think, oh my goodness, there's no way out of this. There's no way that I'm going to be able to make it through this. My finances can't come back. My relationship, there's just no way my relationship can come back. I lost my job. Um, The world's going to hell. Well, most of the world is going to hell. Yes, that's understandable. But listen, change your perspective. Change your way of thinking. You've got to change your way of thinking. Whenever I was in um, the Marine Corps, one of the sayings that we used all the time was, if you don't mind, it don't matter. If you're cold, if you don't mind, it don't matter. If you're wet, if you don't mind, it don't matter. You know, (laughs) listen to me. Change your perspective on things. Change your perspective. Find the silver lining. There is a silver lining. I guarantee you there is. If nothing else, just focus on what Jesus Christ did for us, for him and him crucified, to take our sins away. Focus on the fact that this life doesn't last forever. Focus on the fact that we're going to step from here into eternity, and we get to spend forever worshiping our Savior in the most amazing place that we literally cannot imagine. We absolutely cannot even fathom the joy that we're getting ready to step into. It's amazing. We talked about that the other week, didn't we? So, when your seasons change, who will be your example? Who's going to be your example? Can we look to to media? No. Can we can we look to our, our sports fans, the NBA, the NFL, look at all these guys. They are falling to pieces. What in the world? Can we look to movie stars? No. We have to be there for one another. We have to support one another. We have to strengthen one another. We have to point each other back to God. We have to point each other back to Jesus and the fact that he rules everything, the fact that he never changes He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you look at Hebrews 13, 8, you don't have to turn there, but you can. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Your circumstances, they're going to change. Your season is going to change. But if you want stability, you want that solid rock on which you can stand, you have to be standing on Christ. You have to be standing on that foundation that he's going to support you. He's going to take care of you. He's going to be your refuge and your strength in time of need. What I love is Psalms 102.27 and Hebrews 1.12, they both say the exact same thing. Old Testament, New Testament, they say the same thing. But you remain the same and your years will never end. You remain the same and your years never end. He remains the same. James 1.17, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father, comes from heaven, coming down from our Father who created the heavenly lights. He never changes and casts a shifting shadow. He doesn't change and his shadow doesn't change. He remains the same. Isn't it amazing, though, that we can look at God, we can read this word right here, and God can give you something out of it from the same verse, no matter what season that you're going through. You will get something different out of it for whatever season that you're going through that gives you peace, that gives you hope, 
that gives you strength. And you look at it and you go, I've read this a thousand times. I've never received it this same way. Sometimes we have to hear something over and over for it to really, really, truly sink in. Malachi 3, 6. I love this one. I am, this is God speaking, I am the Lord and I do not change. That is why you, descendants of Jacob, are not already destroyed. I am the Lord and I do not change. That's why we're not already destroyed. That's the Old Testament, people. That's the heart of our Father. Because He loves us. Because He cares about us. Because He cherishes us. Because He wants that relationship with us. That we are not destroyed. We are not, we are not struck down. We are not consumed by our circumstances. But you know what? Even if our circumstances are to take away the physical life that you have, we're still not consumed and we're still not destroyed. That's what's so amazing about it. That's what's so amazing about it. I, I love it. I love it. Rod's mom, 98 years old, goes to the hospital this week. She was having heart issues. I told him, I said, man, I'm praying for her. I did pray for her. I went and got my wife and we prayed for her. But honestly, Rod, I was thinking, 98, heart issues? This doesn't look great. But God said, I don't care how old she is. She's got some more time. They threw in a pacemaker, did some tests. She went back home yesterday. <laughs> what in the world? It doesn't matter what your circumstances look like. It doesn't matter what you think is going to be the outcome. If God wants an outcome one way, it's going to be his way. But I'll tell you, our prayers will move mountains. Our prayers will put him to work. Our faith will get the job done. All right. So I didn't use up a whole lot of time, honestly but I am pretty much done. So let me pray real quick. As we pray, guys, I just want you to be asking the Holy Spirit what he wants you to receive out of this. Ask the Holy Spirit how he wants you to apply this teaching to your life and how he can use you to affect those around you for his kingdom. Heavenly Father, I just pray for the people here today and the people that are online watching and, and listening. Anyone within the sound of my voice, God, I just pray that you will open up their eyes and their minds and their spirits to receive this word today, Lord. I pray that you will touch us through your Holy Spirit, that you will work in us and through us with your Holy Spirit by your mighty power, God. I pray that no matter what seasons that we're in, Lord, that we will look to you and rely on you as our hope and strength. That we will allow you to carry us whenever we can't carry ourselves, Lord. I pray that we won't even try to carry ourselves through these seasons, Lord. God, help us to depend on you. Help us to rely on you. Help us to put ourselves aside and have less of us, Lord, and more of you. Help us to trust that even whenever situations and circumstances seem impossible, that we put our hope in the God of the impossible. Lord, I pray that you will go with us today that you will give us opportunities to be able to love on people and show them your heart, your love, your kindness, your mercy, your goodness, Lord. God, help us to strengthen one another, sharpen one another, and be used as your tools. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.